Okay, so hello everyone. Good morning, good afternoon to each one of you, depending on where you're listening to us from. It's great to see you once more for another SBR webinar. Today is actually the first webinar of 2023. So I'm very excited to be able to come with Joao Diego Oliveira to uh, start this wonderful year of webinars with us. Today, he has a great presentation regarding overcoming resistance in psychotherapy and why it's so difficult. Um, Joao has uh, been kind enough to offer us different uh, times throughout his presentations to ask him questions and, and or, or comments. Maybe we can do this by leaving their comments in the chat box and he will pick them up. Or if you want, you can also turn your microphone on at the designated times and uh, speak with him directly. So um, I don't want to take much more time, but I would like to tell you a little bit about uh, Joao. He is a PhD. He's a junior researcher at the Psychology Research Center at the University of Mino in Portugal. And his scientific interests include process outcome psychotherapy research, such as efficiency and effectiveness, change processes, feedback interventions, and new technology supplied to choose psychotherapy. He has been studying the processes associated with failure in psychotherapy, such as ambivalence and resistance towards change, and interpersonal non complementary Recently, he has been also studying other patriarchal processes at the Unified Protocol for Transdiagnostic Treatment of Emotional Disorders, and has been implementing studies with obsessive compulsive patients using an exposure with response prevention approach. In addition to his research position, he is a lecturer at the School of Psychology of University in Mino, where he teaches under and graduate courses on psychological assessment, clinical intervention, and personality psychology. He also teaches psychology dependencies and crime at law school. And in parallel to his research and treat and teaching duties, uh, Joao has always kept his clinical practice. In 2019, he was also funded by Taylor and Francis through the Emerging uh, Scholars Program promoted by SPR. So, Ro, it is really a huge privilege and, and pleasure to have you uh, telling us a little bit about of your, of your work today. So, Ro, uh, take it away. Thank you very much. Hi, Juan. Hi, y'all. Uh, first of all, thank you for the, the kind words. And uh, and I, was, I also would like to... To share with you my, uh, because I'm honored to to be here uh, presenting in the SPR webinar, um, and in um, in a topic that it's um, uh, the topic of research from the huge names of uh, some of the huge names from SPR, uh, the, from the past and from the uh, from now. For instance, Larry Butler, uh, Michael Constantino, Annie Vestra, and uh, other names that I usually read to do my 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 research and my my PhD. So it's a great honor, and it's my humble contribution for the for the field. I hope you enjoy, and I hope you can put some questions and comments and uh, some thoughts about about this. Okay. So is it okay? Yes, it works perfectly. Okay. So um, the name of the presentation, I was struggling with the name, what, what kind of title I, I would uh, use. And uh, <clears throat> in fact, uh, we all know, or uh, at least we, we also, we heard uh, about the, the, the term of the, or the concept of resistance. We know that it is an important one in psychotherapy process and, uh, and outcome. Uh, however, it's very, very difficult to study and to, and to uh, deal with, with that in, the, in, the, in our clinical practice. And uh, not because it's difficult to, to conceptualize, but it is difficult to understand the different meanings of resistance, different moments of resistance, different um, uh, levels of resistance in different patients, in different uh, uh, processes or therapeutic process. So uh, I tried to, to, to approach this 
all these topics in this uh, uh, webinar. And then starting with the um, more or less uh, um, poetic um, approach to, to the psychotherapy process. Uh, and we, we know that the process of change within and beyond the, the therapeutic co context always involves several challenges. And while there are moments when the individual clearly perceives movements towards a new reality, there are also moments when both the consequences of change and the path to achieve change are immersed in a dense fog. So uh, some of us study um, the efficacy of psychotherapy. Um, in the last years, I'm very focused on the ingredients that break the treatment's success, uh, success or uh, the, why the people um, doesn't achieve change in, in psychotherapy. We all know that psychotherapy works, uh, that it is effective, is more effective than some medical interventions for uh, different uh, uh, conditions. Uh, we know also that uh, different uh, approaches and different uh, um, psychotherapies are equally um, if, if, uh, efficient. Uh, however, we are always struggling with these numbers. 50% uh, of our patients uh, doesn't change. Um, five to 10% of them deteriorate. Uh, and this is particularly important in highly demanding disorders, for instance, personality disorders. Um, so uh, our focus has been this uh, mechanisms that prevent change uh, as well uh, other researchers. So uh, for this, this uh, webinar, I prepared three different uh, moments. Uh, the first one is about some uh, background and some conceptual contributions. The, the second one is about uh, our empirical work on this. And the third one is about uh, some clinical uh, interventions to, to work with the uh, uh, resistance and namely with ambivalence. So starting with the first part, with uh, resistance in psychotherapy. I, I brought some, some uh, uh, parts of uh, some papers from great names uh, that uh, uh, worked and, uh, and still are still working uh, on this topic. And uh, <clears throat> I found this very curious uh, that uh, while they disagree with uh, un, uh, one another in many ways, the more than <clears throat> 400 theories of psychotherapy that are practiced in contemporary society converge on the curious observation that some painfully distressed patients seeking assistance from expensive and highly trained professionals reject their therapist's best advice fail to act in their own best interests and do not respond to the most effective interventions that can be mustered on their behalf. Such patients have been called oppositional, reactionary, non-compliant, intractable, and unmotivated. So uh, just a brief uh, definition of, uh, of uh, resistance. Uh, and the other concept that uh, is very uh, close to resistance, that is reactance. Resistance is the tendency of an individual, individual patient to avoid making the changes advocated by the therapist. Uh, and reactance is an extreme example wherein the patient not only resists, but changes in the direction away from that advocated by the therapist. Okay, so uh, we have a patient uh, in our, uh, with us, and uh, we want that uh, this patient uh, changes. 
we push in, uh, in the way uh, of change. We suggest different things. We prescribe homework. And sometimes uh, our patient resists to what we are demanding. And uh, in, in some cases, these patients uh, are reactant against us. And this means that we are in risk of failure of, 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 the, of treatment. We have different theories about resistance. I brought uh, some three of them, okay? Um, just because, because all of them are important to understand different nuances of, of the, the, the phenomenon. One is the classical psych psychoanalytic theory that views resistance as a central process that is manifested both as a transition situation-specific state in psychotherapy and as an enduring trait-like quality to which some individuals are more predisposed than others. In this case, is the analyst should interpret, in, interpret patient resistance in an attempt to help the patient experience and increase the awareness of the various aspect, aspects of his or her own feelings and impulses that are being repressed. So in, in a way, <clears throat> this, this uh, conceptualization of resistance is a positive one. So uh, it, it's, it's a sign that uh, the, the, uh, the, the patient is assessing some of, uh, uh, of the painful um, memories and, uh, and uh, uh, structures that are not aware, okay? So the, res the resistance uh, has a positive meaning that we are uh, progressing in, in, in therapy. I'm not expert in, in psychoanalytic theory, so if some some people here is experts. I I would love to to hear from from you uh, your your conception about this. Another way, the cognitive behavioral and, and cognitive behavioral theories view resistance as simple uh, non-compliance, which in turn is seen as a, a, an obstruction to goal achievement. So some co social social cognitive perspectives uh, this differentiate between oppositional behavior, which some refer to under the label reactance, and the less insidious form of non-compliance, which is uh, very close to the definition that I, I, I present um, uh, at the beginning. I also brought. Um, <clears throat> An, uh, an idea or some ideas from the solution folks uh, therapy. Uh, this one is from uh, uh, a, a paper uh, which the title is The Death of Resistance. Uh, I recommend all of you to, to, to read this uh, because it's a completely different way to, 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 to see, to view the uh, resistance. And the, uh, the, the examples are from the, the family therapy. So family therapy developed within the larger context of psychotherapy and the interpretation of homeo, homeostasis fits neatly into the clinical concept of resistance or resistance to change. The idea was the family as a system seemed to maintain the status quo through deviation countering uh, processes. The changes in the family as a system were seen as uh, mutual, causal, causal, and negative feedback loops that kept the change within certain limits and constraints. And uh, this approach suggests that we need to, to consider the uh, psychotherapy as a whole system. So in that way, uh, we should not cons uh, consider resistance, but the cooperation between the therapist and 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 uh, the, um, the 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 in, in this case family uh, families. But also we can uh, we can um, see this with individual patients. Later on, I will uh, present some uh, some examples of this. Okay, so 
what we know and uh, some uh, some brief results of of uh, what has been found in the resistance uh, studies, we found that uh, it is negative uh, negatively correlated with treatment uh, success. We know that it is also associated associated uh, associated with uh, disengagement. Uh, patient disengagement, and uh, is also um, uh, associated with poor uh, outcomes in follow-up, uh, so after the end of treatment. Resistance is so important that in this uh, is in this very uh, this beautiful uh, book edited by Kasim Gay, Constantino, Michael Constantin, and Larry Butel, Larry Butler, the they consider um, resistance as a client process variable, and we know that clients who are more resistant to therapies or therapy may uh, benefit less from psychotherapy than clients who are less resistant. But also, we should consider uh, in the treatment provider moderating principles. So clients with higher levels of resistance may benefit more from psychotherapy that is more non-directive compared to clients with lower levels of resistance who may benefit from psychotherapy that is, that is more directive. So here we uh, start to uh, complexify uh, the concept of resistance. So it is something, it's a client variable, at least at the beginning, but then the, it depends how uh, it interacts with the treatment and with the therapist. So complexifying the, this complexity, we have the phenomenon, so the resistance, we have the definitions, we have different theories that uh, allow us to conceptualize the phenomenon, we know that this uh, phenomenon has a huge impact on the uh, on psychotherapy outcomes. But then we also uh, need to consider that are different sources of resistance. Okay. So thinking about sources of of resistance, we uh, should consider patient characteristics. For instance, a uh, high level of traits like uh, resistance levels, okay? Um, the, uh, the age, so older people tend to resist more, okay? But also the diagnosis or problem characteristics that in a way, uh, or some of them are related with patient uh, characteristics. We should also consider motivational aspects or motivational e issues from the, the, the patient. For instance, ambivalence toward change, expectations and uh, treatment goals. And uh, at last, the therapist and treatment characteristics. For instance, um, treatment uh, therapist errors uh, or uh, interpersonal complementarity or non-complementarity. Of course, <clears throat> this uh, sometimes is a little bit artificial, this uh, different ca categorizations because, because some of them are strictly related uh, uh, between, between them. However, in order to be uh, more efficient in uh, uh, answering the client's or patient resistance within uh, the psychotherapy session, we need to consider all of these, these issues, okay? So trying to uh, 
to turn more clear uh, what I was uh, telling before. When we start uh, a process or when we think in, in, in our psychotherapy session, sessions, we have a patient which uh, that come to us uh, presenting uh, his or her uh, main personality and uh, individual characteristics. Uh, we know that our diagnoses that are more difficult than others. Uh, we know that uh, some of our patients are more motivated to change than others. And of course, uh, we are always struggling with the empathy, with the, how we can uh, relate and we can complement uh, and we can uh, create a good alliance, a uh, therapeutic alliance with our client. Thinking on resistance, uh, this is uh, what uh, we expect uh, in good outcome cases. So uh, mainly uh, the, 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 the client or the patient presents higher levels of resistance at the beginning of treatment. And then uh, these uh, resistance levels tend to decrease across, uh, across the treatment. However, sometimes what happens is that uh, the, the resistance uh, levels are, are keep uh, very high and the client drop out from the treatment. There are also um, uh, some occasions where the client presents low levels of resistance but when we start challenging the, the patient, the resistance tends to increase. And then uh, sometimes the client drop out the treatment. In a good example, uh, for instance, when we start challenging the, the, the patient, this resistance tends to increase and then uh, it tends to decrease and uh, uh, until the finish of or end of the treatment. Sometimes we have this different shape, but also we can have this kind of shape is that uh, the client is very resistant at the beginning. We are working with client and uh, uh, the client is uh, less resistance, uh, resistant along the treatment, but then we start challenging more the client, for instance, uh, using exposure uh, interventions with the client, and then the, 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 the resistance uh, increase again and uh, increase the, 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 the probability of dropout. And in the, a good scenario, we have uh, something like this, okay? So all of this, uh, um, examples, uh, or in all of them, the meaning of resistance could be different. Okay, so uh, we can have uh, people that uh, are resistant at the beginning, uh, the, because of the, the 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 characteristics or the individual characteristics. Uh, they can be or can be more uh, uh, resistant because of the treatment, because we are we as uh, therapists were not able to to um, deal with the, the the individual characteristics. So, and this is a very raw uh, example or exercise regarding the patient characteristics. If high traits uh, uh, resistance levels are presented, we know that we should start the treatment with a less uh, directive approach. If we have an uh, obsessive compulsive disorder, uh, then we have to pay attention with, for instance, with exposure exercises. Regarding the motivational issues, if 
a patient is motivated to change, so for instance, um, uh, drinking is not a problem for me, we should promote ambivalence in order to work with this resistance. If uh, we have, we are in the presence of ambivalence toward change, we should work with both positions. So one position uh, uh, in, in the, the direction of in favor of change and the other one against change. And uh, for instance, with the uh, therapy and, and uh, um, therapist characteristics, if a patient is uh, uh, has a, a, an interpersonal um, hostile dominant profile, the therapist should be at least at the beginning of treatment friendly and submissive. So as we can see, uh, this is this are uh, we have a lot of nuances on this, and it's because of that that I, I, I thought on the, the, the title of the presentation as uh, why is it so difficult to work with the resistance in psychotherapy? So um, in this presentation, I will focus more on the motivational issues because also are um, the, the, the aspects that we as therapists can work or have a more uh, probability of work with our clients in, in, in therapy. So before uh, entering in this uh, second second uh, topic, I would also uh, would like to, to, to ask if you have some comments, some suggestions, Denise, I can see you are raising your hand. I'd like to make a comment. Can I? Yes. Um, I, I was thinking that um, what you said um, that psychoanalysis gives a more positive opinion uh, or vision. I have an even more positive uh, one because uh, I think that the issue of power is something that we very seldom discuss, study, do research on. Uh, as concerns uh, as that both as an issue within psychotherapy, relations of power, for example, with your employees and your private life or work, but also between therapist and patient. And I think that resistance, if we are thinking 50% of patients do not change, five to 10 go worse, resistance may also be a very valid defense on the part of the patient. I have seen with my eyes, in Switzerland, uh, psychotherapy designed for African immigrants, children, young children, who was designed to, uh, add, to, to, to make him become little Swiss people, no uh, spontaneity, no music, no nothing, just little robots. And I always thought, I hope they resist therapy. With my eyes, I have also seen Waterstein, president of IPA at that moment, saying that the ideal candidate for psychoanalysis should be dull normal. If I have a dull normal psychoanalyst, I'm sure to resist, thank God. So I think uh, that this is a vision. I mean, resistance can be uh, a category to hide our failings and our uh, inadequacies. And, and my late last comment is cultural issues, because I remember Clara Bass, who is here, talking about somebody doing psychotherapy on a Colombian woman living in Spain who wanted to discuss the relationship with her daughter, which the therapist considered too, too, too close. And Clara said, no, no, in, in, in Ecuador, I'm sorry, in Ecuador, it's like this, this is normal mother-child uh, relationship. So cultural issues are very important. I think that one central element to finish is uh, to explore in greater de depths uh, what are the expectations and the cultural standing of the person we're going to, to treat before starting treatment. 
Thank you very much. I I can uh, made a, a comment of this. I, uh, recently, I also um, attended a, a patient from uh, Africa, um, and uh, I know that the the cult cultural issues are very very different, and uh, I was a little bit anxious uh, about this. And uh, of course, I, I didn't know the characteristics, but I, 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 I knew that me as therapist, I could increase the resistance from her because uh, uh, the cult cultural issues. So yeah, you are, you are right that um, nowadays this, uh, uh, the, 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 the cultural uh, aspects in psychotherapy are one of uh, the things that we should um, explore more and more and resistance is also present here in order that you, you, you have said. Thank you. João, we also have a comment for you in the question box. Um, how do you explain the relation between resistance and rupture? Perhaps is the patient's resistance a way to express a rupture? This is a question by uh, Nelson, Nelson Mendes. Uh, hi, Nelson. Thank you for your question. It's uh, a very interesting one. Um, actually, we are um, exploring this with the, with, with the Chris Moran, Adelio Romanch, uh, uh, trying to understand the associations between ambivalence and alliance ruptures. And I, I'm not an expert in, in alliance ruptures, but I, I think that we can think in the way that you are presenting the resistance, a way to express a rupture, but also we can think in, in the other way around. So uh, the, the presence of the resistance uh, could uh, um, emerge or increase uh, the probability of an alliance rupture. So the idea is that uh, resistance is always an interpersonal uh, uh, phenomenon. So, yeah, uh, but maybe we have this uh, two-way um, direction between resistance and the alliance rupture. Does this make sense to you, Nelson? And uh, I saw that uh, Denise wants to, to move make on. A As yeah, I, I, I also think that resistance is a necessary part of treatment because one should not change uh, just because somebody else says one should. So that's why psychotherapy takes time. One should resist <laughs> because of uh, you, you, your of your identity, of your lifestyle, of everything. If, if, if furthermore, if it is a structural deep changes, not just something situational. Uh, and one suggestion uh, I give to my students sometimes is to introduce this in uh, in the previous interviews. It may happen that at some time you may not be happy, you may think this is good for nothing. Let's pick it up. It's part of the process. Yeah. And, and sometimes it's, uh, it can also be a tool uh, in a more, um, in more paradoxical interventions. Uh, uh, maybe we can, uh, sometimes we force resistance uh, and uh, that, then uh, happens uh, an alliance rupture, but we know from the, the research that uh, the, the alliance rupture repair is, is associated with, with, with the good outcomes. So uh, not all alliance ruptures are, uh, are the, an indicator of uh, a, a bad sign. I, th I think uh, Nelson is, uh, was commenting. No, uh, hi everybody. I was thinking about something you said at the beginning when you said that maybe uh, older patients are more resistant, but I was thinking what about the adolescents in psychotherapy, for example? I was thinking about it. Is is uh, another question for you? Uh, yeah, typically uh, adolescent. I, I don't work with uh, adolescents in, in in therapy. But uh, they, 
in in uh, it depends of the the, the problem I think I think uh, because uh, for definition or per definition uh, uh, the adolescence moment in our lives implies the the um, challenging uh, the world our parents our colleagues and uh, sometimes this happens also in 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 therapy of course. Uh, what I said regarding the older people is that uh, we have a more crystallized framework framework of uh, of meaning, uh, more crystallized problems, and this is more difficult to 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 work with uh, in order to to change. Okay, in the adolescence, we have this: we have high levels of, or of resistance, and we as therapists need to work with this. But then when we achieve uh, a good relationship with, with the adolescent, they are more also more plastic. So the, the, they achieve change in a very uh, more faster or in a faster way. Does this make sense, Nelson? Yeah. <laughs> Joel, perhaps uh, mainly because of, of time-wise, we can move on to your next presentation block. And if people still do have any questions or comments, you can leave them in the chat box uh, and we can pick them up on, on our next uh, uh, Q&A block. <laughs> okay, so thank you for all this insightful uh, uh, questions and suggestions. And uh, as I said, uh, I will now present some empirical work from our um, our team. Uh, this uh, this photo needs this picture needs to to be upgraded, but uh, yeah, uh, this uh, this works or the work with the ambivalence uh, started um, some years ago with the, with the team of uh, Miguel Gonçalves. And uh, um, this team started uh, with the, the exploration of uh, um, uh, using a qualitative approach uh, in narrative therapy. So, and um, maybe some some of you are are uh, of you uh, know about the innovative moments uh, uh, concept. So, uh, I will not focus on innovative moments. So only focus on the the empirical markers of of uh, ambivalent resistance uh, what happened was that um, many years ago uh, the group um, was uh, exploring the um, moments uh, in therapy that are were associated with 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 change and with the uh, good outcome cases um and uh, exploring this, uh, the team also realized that uh, after some of these moments, the client presented uh, steps against change. So they express something. I, I will present uh, an example. They express something in favor of change, and then they present something against change. So this is an example. So my life is miserable. I feel depressed all the time and I have no strength to do anything. There's no pleasure in living for me. Life is a burden. So this is this could be a problematic self-narrative from a, a depressed patient, okay? And here we have uh, what we call a, a, an innovative moment. So curiously, Yesterday, I felt some joy playing with my son and it did feel good, okay? So these moments are associated with uh, good outcomes uh, in, 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 in psychotherapy. Okay, so if we, we think uh, this in, in, in the context of, of therapy and uh, including uh, therapists uh, in this, I have been feeling different this week, feeling safe when interacting with others. 
this is really new and strange in a sense. This is uh, uh, um, an example from uh, um, social uh, phobia or uh, social anxiety. Uh, and the, the, the therapist could ask something like, how do you think this occurred? Okay, I, I'm not sure. I thought about uh, what we discussed last time that I was applying old rules from my early childhood and I tried to be less automatic when interacting with others and I was able to feel it. It was strange because it was new, but it felt, it felt really good. I thought that uh, it didn't make sense to be hooked by my parents' rules and that I need to free myself from the past. I deserve more than what I have. So clearly, clearly we have uh, uh, two different uh, innovative moments here uh, and, uh, um, and very well elaborated with the, 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 the client. So this increases probability of uh, achieving uh, success in, in treatment. But sometimes, and uh, what uh, the team found, uh, found that uh, often or too often, these um, innovative moments were uh, uh, aborted or attenuated uh, right after the, uh, its emergence. So uh, I have been feeling different this week, feeling safe when interacting with others. This is really new and strange in a sense, so an innovative moment. The therapist asked uh, in the same way, how do you think this occurred? And the client uh, said something like, I'm not sure anyway, I know things won't ever change. I'm a depressed person, uh, it's really a curse. So in this, in this example, we see this, uh, what we, we could um, say that is an ambivalent resistance marker. So uh, a moment or an, an innovative moment in order to change and then an attenuation of this uh, because of uh, the, the, the fear of the uncertainty or uh, other thing, okay? Does this make sense? Okay, so uh, the team started to started publishing uh, uh, about this uh, several years ago. <laughs> um, and, um, at the beginning, working with uh, with some case studies, doing qualitative research, exploring in depth uh, each case. So there are different uh, publications uh, about about this, uh, and uh, more recently, uh, using also um, uh, hierarchical linear modeling to uh, explore the the. Um, the results from the qualitative uh, codings. Um, so not only using case studies, but also using um, uh, uh, a more, uh, it's not always, it's, it's impossible to have a, a big sample, but uh, a sample uh, that is enough to, to do uh, this kind of, of uh, procedures. So in some, uh, we could have someone that says that I'm a loser, I'm not good at anything, but I deserve to be happy just like other people, but I can't, this sadness is in my genes, so, and that there is a return to the, to the problem again, okay? And it was uh, in this context that we started to uh, work more and more in depth with uh, uh, in the ambivalence toward change, okay? So ambivalence is a client variable characterized by an intrapersonal conflict between two positions of, of the self, one in favor of change and another one in, in the favor of the status quo. And this implies movement towards and away from change. So it's, uh, in a sense, it's like a system with a kernel and two, uh, two vectors that uh, are non isomorphic in, 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 uh, uh, and between them and uh, that goes in different, in different uh, um, ways. 
I want to change, but I can't. I don't know if it's better to change or not to change, okay? And what we found uh, and uh, other, other uh, authors found, found that ambivalence levels are associated with resistance and reactance to change, with motivation to change, and with engagement with therapy and increases the risk of poor outcomes in therapy. So it was because of that that we uh, started uh, exploring more and more the ambivalence concept. The idea is that uh, we have several factors, several constructs that are associated with, with outcomes. Severity, openness, cooperation, bounds, suitability, collaboration, a lot of them, okay? We know also that there are uh, two that are very uh, close between them and very associated with, with outcomes, engagement and resistance. So we know that uh, although in some, in some processes we need uh, uh, resistance could be a good sign, if this resistance continues, uh, this increases the probability of, of, of uh, failure in treatment. And we know also that the client needs to be engaged with treatment in order to achieve success. And uh, our, uh, our uh, suggestion is that ambivalence is before this, it's a way of uh, working to increase engagement and to decrease resistance. Okay. So one of the things was to how to measure this intrapersonal tension, because uh, if, if we are coding the, the, um, uh, the sessions, we are assessing the, the verbal um, uh, moments in therapy, and uh, it's more difficult to access to the intrapersonal tension. Okay, some of this interpersonal tension is expressed by words, but not all of them. So what, what we did, we, we developed a self-report questionnaire based on all the work did uh, in the previous uh, uh, years with innovative moments and, uh, and uh, ambivalence markers. And we developed a, a self-report uh, uh, questionnaire and we started uh, collecting with patients at the beginning of each session. And the, the, this measure um, is composed by nine items. It's uh, very short. And uh, it has uh, items like, I have not been able to change, or sometimes I question everything that involves change. Sometimes I think that everything will go well, others that everything will stay the same or get worse. So. One of the things was to understand the congruence between uh, self-report and uh, observer ratings of uh, ambivalence. And uh, with the 120 sessions from, from uh, 15 patients uh, using uh, or in the, the unified protocol for transdiagnostic treatment of emotional disorders, uh, we studied the um, we used the ambivalence psychotherapy questionnaire, the outcome to, to understand the, the status of each, of each patient, and, uh, the, and the sessions were coded using ambivalence, uh, the ambivalence coding system. And what we found was that, oh, the, the legend is, is uh, in Portuguese, I'm sorry. Uh, it's, um, we can see that uh, there are a similar, a similar pattern uh, when, is self, when the ambivalence is self-reported and when the ambivalence is uh, observed. Uh, it's not exactly the same, and it is good that it's not exactly the same, but they follow the, the, same, the same pattern, which is also good. And we found that um, the client ambivalence self-reported levels 
at the beginning of each session predicts the levels of uh, ambivalence uh, uh, during the session uh, coded by external uh, uh, observers. Okay. And then we started exploring uh, the, uh, the association between ambivalence and uh, outcomes. And here uh, we have um, the comparison between sudden gains and, and dropouts. Or they are two different studies, but uh, first we focused on sudden gainers, then we focus on, on dropouts. Also in the unified protocol uh, treatment, uh, uh, with the 68 cases in, in the study of, of uh, sudden gainers, and uh, with 96 uh, patients uh, in dropout study. And what we found was that uh, in, when, when comp we compare sudden gainers with non-sudden gainers, they, uh, the, they start therapy uh, uh, presenting the same level of uh, ambivalence. Uh, there are no differences at the beginning. They both decrease uh, across treatment because, uh, as I said, if ambivalence and resistance levels remains high, there is there are a, a high probability of dropping out the treatment. So to finish the treatment, these levels needs to decrease across treatment. But what happened was that in the the sudden gainer group. The, um, they uh, decrease more or faster uh, um, the levels of, of ambivalence. Uh, when we compare dropouts, and uh, these are uh, clients that doesn't finish the, 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 the treatment, but we compare it a good outcome versus poor outcome dropouts, and uh, we found that they finish because we start we we did this analysis departing from the last session to the the first session so what we found was that in the last session uh, the group that uh, is a poor outcome uh, dropout presents a higher level of of ambivalence before dropping out although they decrease uh, across treatment, both groups, they finish differently. And in uh, also in the poor outcome dropouts, we found that they slightly increase the levels of ambivalence before the decision of dropping out, which is very useful and insightful uh, for us. Then we uh, also performed some, uh, this, uh, we, we would, this idea of different meanings of resistance, different meanings of ambivalence was in our heads, uh, in our minds uh, for a long time. So, but how we could uh, explore this and uh, we started doing this, uh, exploring if we found uh, differences with, on the effects uh, of uh, ambivalence in outcomes within and uh, if you found effect, different effects within and, and between patients. So we, we developed a, a study uh, where we explored um, using hierarchical linear models uh, how the, 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 the ambivalence uh, levels predicts outcomes using uh, the, the OQ10 and the levels of uh, emotional dysregulation. And why emotion, uh, emotional dysregulation? Because unified protocol treatment targets the, the emotional uh, regulation processes. So first, what we found uh, was, and 
uh, important is was that ambivalence uh, follows not a linear uh, linear uh, trend but a log linear, which means that uh, we expect a huge decrease at the beginning or at least at uh, the session four or five, and then it tends to uh, decrease, still decrease, but in a not so fast way, which uh, which uh, is um, which tell us that it is important to uh, to work with this uh, with ambivalence at the beginning of treatment and needs to be resolved to promote engagement, uh, the, the patient engagement. So then uh, we found that uh, we found different uh, uh, within and between uh, effects. So uh, saying that uh, we should pay attention in different uh, patterns when we compare between, between um, uh, patients. So the association between ambivalence and outcomes could be different uh, when we compare uh, within the patient and between, it has different meanings, okay? And we also found that uh, when we uh, include the, the um, uh, ambivalence uh, here in the, in the, the equation, the model uh, uh, explains more, it's more uh, uh, fits uh, compared with when we doesn't consider ambivalence. And we also uh, detrended the model because th the thing or the idea was that, well, maybe all of this is only a matter of time. So, uh, but when we detrend the model, so when we consider the session, we still have uh, positive uh, results within and, and between patients. And, uh, we also wanted to explore if this happens only in the beginning of treatment or in the later phases of treatment. And we found that there is no difference. So uh, this kind of relationships and this difference between and within patients, um, the effects uh, we can uh, find at the beginning and at the end of treatment. It's not only a matter of, uh, 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 treatment moment. And uh, again, we, we performed the, the same models with, uh, with uh, emotion regulation or dysregulation. And uh, the, um, the findings were uh, pretty the same. Okay. I will not explore in depth. So uh, then we wanted to explore the association between ambivalence that we uh, we depart from resistance, we go to, to ambivalence and then to explore the associations uh, just like I presented before. So this was one of the, the, the first uh, 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 exercises to, to do this, uh, the, these associations or test these associations. And the idea is that uh, in psychotherapy, we are, we are in the presence of an inter interpersonal, um, interpersonal uh, phenomenon or context. And in this context, we can or uh, can, exp or can emerge interpersonal uh, tensions and uh, resistance, reactance, and non-compliance can appear. So when we focus on the motivational issues or motivation aspects from the patient, we need to consider uh, client motivations, uh, client goals, expectations, and also ambivalence toward change. When uh, uh, this uh, ambivalence is present, so the client is struggling with the idea of changing or not change, this will um, 
uh, appear in the interpersonal uh, uh, um, context of the, the psychotherapy. And the we as psychotherapists want that the, the client achieve change. So sometimes we push more our clients. If the client is struggling with this uh, inter interpersonal tension, uh, it, the, the, the probability of emerging more interper interpersonal tension increases. So leading to resistance, reactance, and uh, alliance ruptures. I, I don't know if you want to me to, to stop here. Uh, I have some two or three more studies to, to present, but I don't know if because uh, I'm feeling that I, I talked a lot and uh, <laughs> about several uh, different things. Um, so are you proposing we do the, the the question docs right now, or did you have a plan for for a couple of minutes uh, in a, in a little while? I I I, I was asking about. Uh, if people have some comment right now, uh, or should I proceed? Okay, I will proceed and then uh, we stop at the end of the empirical uh, stuff. So uh, an exploratory uh, study that we performed uh, we use the uh, the patient interpersonal uh, patient therapist interpersonal complementarity uh, in dropout and sudden gain cases, and we wanted to understand the associ association between the uh, this uh, uh, diet complementarity with levels of of ambivalence. Um, so uh, to to do this, uh, we use the interpersonal transactions scale that is an observer rating scale uh, that departs from the interpersonal circ complex, and we uh, we code the the first session, the session before the sudden gain or the dropout before dropping out, the session of the, the sudden gain, so the session. Where the the the, the sudden gain happened, or the last session of the dropout, and the session after the sudden gain. So we don't have the session after dropout because uh, of the, the phenomenon. So and what we found, we explored the patient agency. I will not explore in depth. If you want, I can I, I can talk about this later on. But uh, we found uh, different directions uh, when we compare with uh, sudden gainers and uh, and the uh, dropouts. Uh, in terms of therapist agency, um, the 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 pattern is uh, the pattern is similar. So, uh, but when we explore the reciprocity, so uh, reciprocity is the the how the agency of the patient and the agency of the therapist uh, are uh, complementary. Uh, we found a similar pattern, but this probably has uh, different, uh, different uh, meanings. Uh, if we explore this, uh, we, we have some clues about, about that. And uh, also in terms of patient affiliation, we found uh, different uh, different patterns, and also in therapist affiliation when we compared dropouts and and sudden gains. But uh, for this uh, this study and for the, the webinar, the 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 more the result more important is this one that we found that the um, ambivalence felt by and uh, by the, the, the client has an implication with the therapist affiliation within the session so uh, this is an exploratory uh, um, result uh, but 
makes sense with the idea that the clients that are struggling with the intrapersonal tension are more challenging uh, within the session. And uh, as a therapist, we have to deal with this uh, with this uh, tension that always, not always, but uh, several times are expressed as uh, interpersonal tension. So our affiliation tends to to decrease with this 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 clients, which increases the prob probability of failure. So um, now we are uh, we thought okay so we are able to. Um, study the ambivalence levels, uh, which is a, a predictor or probably a predictor of resistance. But now we want to uh, access the resistance in order to explore and to test these associations that are some of them more conceptual. So uh, when we... Um, we try to find some uh, coding or some measures to, to access uh, or to evaluate uh, resistance in psychotherapy. We have some coding systems, for instance, uh, client resistance scale from Mahalik, it's an uh, observer rating, the counter change talk for, from uh, uh, Vestra's uh, group. Uh, and then we also have some other coding systems that doesn't access uh, uh, resistance directly, but uh, they access they they allow us to 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 capture some phenomena that are very closely related with resistance. Some, for instance, uh, alliance ruptures um, or uh, the the interpersonal transaction scale, homework rating scale, ambivalence coding system. And when we uh, focus on self-report, we have the Hong psychological reactance scale, the therapeutic reactance scale, the resistance to change, or also we can uh, use some, some subscales from, uh, from uh, Minnesota multiphasic uh, personality inventory, uh, for instance, psychopathic deviate, paranoia, treatment readiness, cynicism and anger uh, that are associated with client characteristics uh, of patients more more resistant. Uh, however, when um, first we can use coding systems, but this prevents us to 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 explore big bigger samples. And when we go to self-report measures, uh, most of them has uh, questions like this one. I have a strong desire to maintain my personal freedom. If I am told what to do, I often do the opposite. I generally consider changes to be a negative thing. When I'm informed of change of plans, I tense, uh, uh, I tense up a, a bit. So thinking on this and thinking on the possibility of changes in the resistance levels throughout treatment um, probably this uh, answers or the answers of to these uh, items will not uh, change too much at least in brief uh, uh, treatments so and what we we wanted was to capture resistance and the, the resistance fluctuation session by session. And uh, um, there is a, a study from uh, Vester's group uh, where they uh, used this, um, this, this approach. They asked to directly to the, the therapy, the therapist in the session you just completed with your client please approximate how often the client opposed or went against the direction you were setting or watching to go in. How cooperative was the client in this session? And uh, how often did you feel uh, that you and the client were at cross purposes? 
So this is uh, this could be a way to to do that. Uh, however, we are asking the the, the 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 therapist directly about the the resistance levels. So now we are developing um, a question a questionnaire that will be completed by the 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 therapist at the end of treatment. Okay, about the resistance against the therapist, the resistance to change, the opposing insight moments, the dominant hostile interpersonal uh, behaviors from the, th the, 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 the therapist, the, the, the patient that was felt by the, the, the therapist and uh, focusing more in behaviors that happened uh, within the session. And regarding the results, uh, I hope that we have some results to present in the, the next, uh, next uh, SPR conference. Um, so, but the idea is to work in direction of treatment personalization in terms of the resistance levels. So, uh, we have the baseline motivation, expectation, resistance, and personality characteristics. Nowadays, we also uh, have uh, developing some uh, a new study uh, trying to understand ambivalence levels before the session, the first session, uh, and daily uh, access it. Then we we can have within session self report, so the client answer the ambivalence levels at the beginning and the therapist at the beginning of, of each session and the therapist uh, at the end of each session the, the resistance levels and we also have the uh, opportunity to code the uh, what happens within the session using qualitative uh, methods like uh, using uh, the ambivalence uh, coding system so the idea is also to, in certain moments, to assess this phenomenon uh, outside the, 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 the session, okay? And then we can perform at the end of treatment the, um, the assessment also. Uh, just to, to finish this uh, empirical chunk, uh, we also recently developed uh, in our team um, a, a study uh, outside from psychotherapy fields uh, using a brief uh, and or a low intensity intervention uh, where the, the patients uh, wrote about uh, a problem and uh, they had uh, different uh, tasks to perform. So it was an online program uh, with 20 minutes writing tasks on four consecutive uh, days, performally autonomously in combining expressive writing tasks and positive writing tasks. And what we found was that um, these uh, tasks decreased the levels of ambivalence regarding the problem from the of the, the the students and we also found that the ambivalence uh, mediated the relationship between the the distress at the the beginning and the stress at the end of treatment and also the rumination uh, levels uh, about the about the problem so some questions now or comments oh i actually have a personal question myself um are patients or clients aware of their ambivalent answers and if they're not, how do they respond when confronted with the fact that they're having such opposite uh, answers? Uh, in fact, when we thought at the beginning about this about this uh, this questioner, 
was to use it as a, as a feedback tool. So, and we performed uh, um, an RCT uh, where uh, all the, 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 the patients filled in the, the questionnaire, but with some of them, we, uh, the therapists uh, could work with the results. So uh, we found that uh, uh, this is very, uh, very useful because it opened the opportunity to discuss with the client about this interpersonal tension. So I saw that in this, in this, during this week, your doubts about changing or uh, uh, you are struggling with some difficulties to, to change. What happened? Could we talk uh, about more about this? So this, ch this change the focus on the, uh, to the uh, process uh, variable in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the psychotherapy or in the session. So, um, and of course it depends always uh, what we do with the questionnaire. And uh, some of, of our therapists use it, some of, of uh, uh, others maybe those, doesn't use nowadays, but uh, at that moment we had this uh, insights from the therapist. Some of the therapists are also in the audience, so <laughs> they, can also uh, say something about that. I don't know if I, I answered your. Yes, perfectly. Thank you. It's great work you're doing. It's 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 really great. Yeah. I just want to say something <laughs> yeah. because I have already used the feedback system that John John talked about, and I think is very useful to discuss with the client. Uh, what is happening uh, for the ambivalence level levels being so higher. But I have a doubt. Uh, when we have a client that presents ambivalence across several sessions and the therapist uh, has already talked with the clients and explore uh, different pathways, you no, know, if at some point, if I have a negative, uh, uh, if I have always a negative feedback, how this impact in the therapist relationship with the client, because the therapist is dealing with insuccess in some way. So I don't know if you have some thoughts about this. Well, uh, my, my thoughts are also uh, as, uh, as a, a therapist. Uh, I have some, some clients uh, I'm I'm a CBT therapist, and uh, mostly I use uh, brief interventions. Uh, but I also have some patients with longer uh, longer treatments, and it is very hard to me to 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 deal with 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 this uh, uh, success, or at least it's not an insuccess. It's it's we have to to give time to to the patient. Uh, and I'm not uh, so um, comfortable with that, with that, uh, with that approach. So what I have, uh, I would say is that we also need to develop our skills to uh, be patient with our with our uh, patients uh, until until they achieve or not the sometimes they 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 go uh, better then they go worse then go better again they go worse again and uh, this is very demanding for us as as, as therapists uh, of course and uh, what what i do is usually i i use different approaches uh, to to work with 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 uh, with ambivalence and uh, in the case that i i already work uh, the patient know that uh, when I uh, okay, let's explore this duality, and they they know that they already did. So, but we do again, and we do different uh, uh, approaches. Uh, and uh, yeah, the thing is more personal. It's it's more how 
can I deal with, uh, with this patient <laughs> that doesn't improve uh, in the way that I, I, I wanted to? I don't know if I answered. Yes, yes, thank you. Thank you. I don't know if we have more comments. Yeah. 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 You, you said that some some therapies use uh, the feedback with their patients, and some of them they are not using the feedback. How do you how are you controlling the effect of of that? No, when because. Nowadays we we are not uh, we are not uh, we we finished the the, the RCT so uh, the the idea uh, when when we were running the RCT uh, we we were uh, with the same condition in every yeah every case yeah, yeah. oh okay yeah. okay so okay nowadays we we still use uh, with our patients. The questioner, but we are not exploring uh, the impact of using uh, uh, using it as a feedback tool or not. Yeah. Yeah. Does this make and, sense? But yeah, 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 yeah. And I was also thinking about the therapist resistance, or or it, it, it is a crazy question. <laughs> I don't know. What about the the therapist resistance? Yeah, in a way, uh, this uh, new study that I was talking about uh, of uh, uh, rating the therapists and uh, analyzing or evaluating evaluating patients' uh, resistance levels, one of the aims or the goals is to understand if there are some uh, therapist characteristics that are associated with higher levels of resistance and higher levels of um, uh, from from the, the the so the idea is if my characteristics impacts in my view about the patient levels uh, of patient resistance levels. Okay, so this is one one of the uh, one of the goals, and uh, and yeah, of uh, I, I would say that yes. Uh, for instance, uh, I am a more directive uh, therapist. M maybe uh, I will feel more more resistance mm -hmm. from from the the patient mm -hmm. than uh, a, a, a therapist that is more personal centered, for instance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the, it's the fourth topic that uh, the source of resistance in, depends on also the the therapy itself it's and the therapist. Yeah, 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 it's true. Maybe it's not an explicit resistance uh, from from therapist, but maybe there are some. Uh, maybe uh, I don't know. Maybe there is there there are implicit ways ways to be resistance with our patients. Yeah, the, the thing is, maybe we start being more demanding. For instance, we are uh, we we push more. We uh, the, the the client uh, start to presenting some some. Uh, um, some aspects of uh, not changing as positive ones and we doesn't care about that mm -hmm. we only focus on well okay but you need to do this to mm -hmm. the <laughs> to task change. yeah yeah you, you need to expose yourself to to mm -hmm. to achieve uh, uh, and i know that you know you you need to do that mm -hmm. yeah so it's more in this way i think yeah yeah, Denise, your microphone is off. 
Now, I was thinking that it, this also has to do with the narcissism of uh, the therapist uh, and how well this is um, uh, worked through in his own personal therapy because uh, a therapist may be absolutely wrong in what he uh, suggests a patient uh, should do or which course of action or life he should take. And, uh, and when the patient persists, how open is the therapist to say, I was wrong to admit it to the patient, no? I say, what am I doing wrong? Or how much this, is, this stands as uh, resistance, as Juan uh, uh, Nelson says, um, on part of the therapist to, to accept change in himself, in the sense that we all uh, think and know that therapy should change both therapist and patient. So um, the fact that the therapist should admit to the patient that he was wrong and, and supervision may be a great help for this, no? to come back to the next session and say, well, I've been reflecting and I think I was wrong in what I, I, I pointed out or I suggested or whatever. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, when we think in, in the client's very, very demanding, uh, um, it's... Uh, for us as therapists, it's very difficult, even if we are not narcissists, but uh, uh, it, it puts uh, ourselves uh, in, in, in a double check. So uh, for instance, a borderline personality disorder is very, very demanding for us as, 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 as therapists. And uh, yeah, um, of course that we have our personal characteristics and uh, some of our personal characteristics will uh, be, um, will impact more in the, in the in, in therapy, of course. And the narcissist uh, uh, traits are uh, one of them, of course. So we have a, a question uh, or a comment coming in the, the question box. Well, uh, first, uh, Nelson says that he agrees with Denise, but that it also could be related with the therapist's approach. And the other comment is from uh, Joanna, and uh, I'm going to read it. Uh, it says, I think it is important to don't put the responsibility of resistance on the patient, because in some way this can interfere with my interaction with the patient. If we're talking about someone who rejects treatment, maybe you were talking about someone who an experienced experience rejecting in the same way. So I think it might not be useful to put any responsibility on the client regarding compliance with the treatment. I don't know if this makes sense, but to you, it's my point of view. <laughs> yeah, it's it makes sense. I, I would say what I, I said before that uh, in fact, resistance can have different meanings. And uh, this is the, the huge challenge uh, of working with resistance, that some clients or some patients, yeah, maybe uh, it's because of this, sometimes it's uh, the, the, the other characteristics. And, uh, but if we think in this, in this way, it helps us as therapists to, to, to to work with client resistance in session, of course. Denise? Um, no, I, I was uh, also thinking that um, um, accepting one's errors and at least coming back to the patient is another way of what is now so, so much um, in the talking about this uh, permanent assessment and feedback of how therapy is going. Uh, in the way we have been discussing it in SPR and it has been um, disseminated, it's always a third person or a questionnaire which is given to the patient saying, how are we going? But uh, in this case, I think that it is the therapist also who can sort of introduce this into the process, say, well, I, I, I feel you are not uh, fine. I feel we're not going on well. How are you feeling? This feedback within session by the therapist himself. And, um, and another issue I think is that it's very important for the therapist and again, supervision can help to discriminate how much of this resistance has to do with the real relation between the two persons or with transference. I remember a patient, I was three hours with her trying her not to commit suicide until midnight. 
And I, well, she did not. And I called her to come next month morning. And she came in and said, I know you don't care about me. And I said, I know I do care about you. What makes you think I don't care? And she said, because in the last five minutes before midnight, you slightly closed your eyes. So that was not the real relationship. That was transference, obviously. And I said, well, uh, uh, let's discuss why you thought I could not care with the evidence that I was with you three hours at midnight, just for a blink of a eye. So I think this is a very important clinical issue. Is it transferential resistance? Am I resisting, suppose, the father I see in you? Or is it resistance in the real relationship? I am resisting you, you, the real person, who are telling me this or saying this. And this has to do with two other concepts, which is therapy by attitude, how, how what you were saying, no? And more directly or moreover. And also uh, the concept of... Uh, personalizing treatment, which are two concepts, more general mm -hmm. concepts, but also associated with this. Yeah, thank you. Uh, because um, again, I, I think that uh, these are very good examples of uh, different meanings of resistance and the importance that, uh, how important it is to understand these different meanings, the different sources, in order to to work with uh, with patient uh, with patient resistance and uh, and work with uh, our characteristics in in the, in with these these patients. Thank you, Denise. Should I proceed? Okay, so uh, this is a, a briefer. Uh, um part the briefer parts of the the presentation <laughs> but uh i i i found that uh, we should also um discuss a little bit about some techniques uh, specific for for uh resistance and there are several techniques uh, of course and uh, one of them is uh, motivational interviewing i will not explore because uh uh, it is it ha it has um several conceptual uh, assumptions uh i could also i could only uh, present some of the assumptions so what i i, I brought was uh three different uh, techniques that we could uh, use in 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 our practice uh that are um demanding challenging but uh, uh at the same time we can integrate with uh, with no difficulties in our uh approach wherever the approach we we are using one of them is to share work of course we uh uh most of us associate uh, to share work to the emotion focused therapy but uh, the to share work as a technique uh comes uh, before and uh, and of course it's a more experiential technique so uh, it is uh, completely uh, um, in line with uh, with the emotion focused uh, therapy uh, approach but uh, in, in in the idea is that uh, uh, we can use uh, to share so the idea is to create or to promote the awareness of these conflicting parts of the self that are uh, one in favor of change and another one in favor of the status quo. So uh, it allows the patient to explore the conflicting uh, uh, internal feelings about change, part of them in favor of change, but another part is deeply hesitant about change, using two shares to promote an incession experiential dialogue between the selves uh, that in conflict. The emotional arousal during the two share work is, is the awareness of the arguments from each voice and the dialogue between them, putting the, the patient in a better position to resolve their ambivalence. So uh, um, we, can, uh, we can do this using uh, other techniques, and the next one is, uh, is an example. Uh, the, the idea here is that uh, we use the experiential dimension uh, in order to, to create uh, and to promote the, the awareness and to promote 
the, uh, the awareness of the arguments between each of this. And what I found with my clients that uh, even when I, uh, I don't use to share work, I, uh, from the beginning of treatment, I, when, I, when there is, uh, we, we are in presence of the ambivalence, I always try to, um, to, uh, to say to my clients that, uh, yeah, this is like two voices inside of you, these two parts of you, or uh, some, sometimes uh, we give names to, the, to each part. And this uh, is important to uh, understand this, this, this tension and to work with the, the, the with the, the tension trying to promote the negotiation between the two the two uh the two parts of the self or the two selves or the two voices uh inside of the of the the, the patient another another one is the decision cube technique it's a very very um uh, easy one that we can we can use uh, and uh, for instance uh, it it is used uh, in the OP treatment um, at the beginning of treatments try to to promote motivation uh, to change and the, the idea is uh, that we explore with the, the the patients and we we ask the patient to to write the arguments uh, uh, the pros and benefits uh, in order to change, the, the costs of changing, the costs of staying the same, and the benefits of the staying the same. Too often, uh, it's uh, the, the, the patient, uh, when we ask, uh, okay, what are the benefits of staying the same? They, uh, they are, this is new for them because they are in, in therapy to change. And when we ask, okay, what are the benefits to you to stay the same? This uh, uh, in, starts to improve uh, the awareness the, of the arguments that keeps the, or prevents the patient to, to change and to, to engage in treatment, to engage in the, in the, in the, uh, in the therapy itself. Um, another uh, set of, of um, interventions, uh, because we, we saw that uh, the literature suggests that uh, um, paradoxical interventions are uh, interventions that we can use with resistant uh, uh, treat, uh, uh, patients. Of course, it depends on the, the, the approach of the therapist, and uh, the idea is, here is that uh, some of these interventions uh, uh, implies some therapist characteristics, and uh, so this needs to be congruent with the, the therapist profile. Okay, so I will present some 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 uh, two of them. One of the thing is uh, the question uh, techniques from the systemic and the strategic approach. I brought uh, some uh, two examples from the that paper that I mentioned before. Uh, so, for instance, uh, we can ask to our client. In this case, uh, would be a family. Between now and next time we meet. Uh, we or I would like you to, to observe so that you can describe to us or to me next time what happens in your family that you want to continue to have happen. Okay, So the question in the next session should not be, did you do the homework? But, uh, but rather, what happened that you want to continue to have happen? So this is... Uh, this, can be slight. It's only a matter of of uh, of um, uh, language, but um, in fact, with some uh, patients, uh, when we use the, the 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 word homework, this increases the their resistance. An another example could be uh, 
the form the therapist's question during uh, take during the session can also be used in promoting the expectations of changing. For instance, it, it is a question of when the changes will happen, not if. So how are you going to overcome the temptations to overheat, uh, but rather what are you going to do when they overcome the temptations to overeat? Okay, so again, this is a, a slight difference. It implies slight differences in language, but uh, probably in the first uh, way we are um, promoting or we are more in risk of promoting um, uh, resistance in our patients. Uh, Denise, do you want to... to I, I understood that you are not uh, uh, agreeing with this. But, yeah. <laughs> no, okay. uh, first of all, in my idea, uh, paradoxical interventions, uh, I have another idea, which is sort of saying exactly the opposite. Uh, for example, I remember a, a patient who did not want to see her newborn baby, and it was a life extremely dangerous situation. And so the intervention was, well, really, it's a horrible baby. You shouldn't see him, which is ethically terrible is manipulation. I did it twice in my 30 years as a therapist, but it was a life or death. And that's what at least I understand as paradoxical and it should be handled with extreme care. I, I, in my view, what you mentioned is confrontation. And I think that, uh, I think, no, it, it, there is evidence that confrontation is a, a very dangerous technique in fragile patients. So uh, I should say that for any of these technical suggestions, because there may be students among the audience, the first question is who is having the resistance? And so which is the set of techniques I'm going to use? For a fragile person, resistance may mean keeping uh, a very um, essential wall of protection, and it may be very dangerous uh, to to overcome this, uh, this this to to throw down this wall. So that was my comment. Yeah, thank you, Denise. It's uh, a very very important comment. Uh, uh, as I said. Um, this this kind of interventions are very challenging, demanding, and uh, uh, it ha it implies that the the at least in my point of view, the therapist needs to have a, a specific profile uh, because otherwise it, it will be completely different of the the intervention from the the therapist, and it will uh, works terribly terribly bad. So thank you. And uh, the, the, the other uh, um, example that I brought in, maybe we can discuss later on, uh, of uh, paradoxical interventions. There are a lot of them, and uh, I really like this kind of uh, interventions. Uh, but uh, yeah, they, we have to use uh, with, with, uh, with cautious. Uh, there are of course, different uh, different um, uh, authors, but Bateson, Václavík uh, are always uh, uh, authors uh, that came to, to, to my mind. And uh, I, I brought um, an example uh, from, from a case of mine of a paradoxical reframing um, that... Um, the, the assumption is that centering on the assumptions that to support the conclusions from the, 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 the patient and using the main patient's concern or argument, for, for example, preoccupation about something, putting side by side the patient assumptions and the paradoxical assumption that leads to the same conclusion. Uh, and uh, as Denise uh, um, uh, mentioned before, this was with a client uh, that um, uh, is with me for several sessions, and the, the shape of the of uh, his resistance is something like this one. So he was, uh, it, it is a, an obsessive compulsive uh, patient. Uh, the there uh, his his uh, level of resistance was very high at the beginning. It decreased. Uh, a long treatment, 
but then we needed to um, to expo to to do some exposure exercises to uh, some central and nuclear uh, fears. So the the uh, his resistance increased a lot. So and uh, I brought the the example. The assumption was that I have to do A, and this could be put the mouse cursor in a, a given position or thinking in something or uh, and uh, other kind of, of uh, compulsions. Uh, otherwise, my parents will suffer something uh, terrible. So the conclusion here is that I am responsible for something bad that could happen to my parents. Um, a paradoxical reframing here uh, was, uh, could be, and it was, your biggest concern is that something very bad happens to your parents. It's a legitimate concern. We all want to, the people we care about to be well, and that's why we do everything we can in that regard. However, have you noticed that your parents have been worried about you for years because of these obsessive thoughts and compulsions taking over you. Uh, they have been suffering a lot for more than, what, 30 years? So uh, here it's uh, we can see that this is very challenging, of course. I could uh, did this with the, the patient uh, because the, the therapeutic alliance was uh, already well established, um, and uh, and uh, I al already used some some strategic uh, interventions with him. So this uh, allowed the opportunity to 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 exposure to do some uh, uh, exposure exercise within the session. And uh, of course, we had to, to talk a lot, uh, more and I, I did more paradoxical reframing uh, afterwards, but uh, this allowed the opportunity to do this uh, exposure in, in, in session and, uh, and opens, opened the opportunity to do uh, outside the, the, the session. So uh, before the last uh, comments and uh, and the questions from you, I would like to um, to say thanks to all the people that have been working on this uh, uh, in, in our team. Uh, so and, and other uh, students, master students that. Uh, uh, only it's only because of them that we are uh, we have these results and we have this this work. So thank you. Some of them are here. So thank you for all of your efforts uh, and uh, working hard for 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 this. And also some uh, external collaborators, some mentors that uh, have been uh, very very useful. And I'm very grateful uh, to them, all of them. Um, in this in these years, and uh, of course, uh, the knowledge, the funding that uh, uh, we uh, have been uh, uh, to to develop this this works. So, thank you. Thank you, thank you so much, Shrao, for this great great presentation. Um, I think you've done. A wonderful job at um, showing us how uh, research and clinical practice have to go hand in hand and how each one of them makes the other one possible and uh, all in favor of giving it the best help that we possibly can. So uh, thank you, Shrao, for, for your presentation. Um, we are a little bit over the the clock. So but before we finish up, I would like to send everyone through the chat the links to uh, our um, uh, Society for Psychotherapy Research webpage and the YouTube channel where this uh, webinar will be posted in a little while and where you may also find all of our previous events. Uh, you, there's also our Facebook page where you can find out about uh, our future events that are coming and as Israel said in his presentation, the annual meeting that will be in 
Dublin this year and will have a mixed modality. So you can also follow online for those that cannot uh, assist. Uh, but Joao, uh, once again, thank you very, very much for uh, your patience with us and sharing all of your uh, wonderful work. And thanks everyone in the audience for being part of this presentation. See you at the next webinar. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.